Good evening. I want to welcome you to our concluding lesson in our study of the book of Job this evening as we examine the final chapter of this story and where we will find Job demonstrating complete humility before the Lord and acknowledging uh, that God is all-powerful and that he is indeed sovereign. As we mentioned last week, Job never really gets a full explanation from the Lord as to the reasons for his suffering, but we see him in this chapter placing his faith and trust in God's goodness and the Lord ultimately rewarding him by restoring his possessions and even blessing him with the same number of children he had lost when the storm struck the house where they had gathered. Job's initial words to the Lord in verses 1 and 2 point us back to something that we observed last week as well. When God spoke of himself as the Almighty One, the Hebrew word El Shaddai, you might recall that I shared at that time that the root meaning of that word is the one who overpowers that word reminds us that God's power, his purposes and plans will not be thwarted by man. No one can stand before him or resist his power and might. And in, a sense, in essence, that's what Job declares in verse 2 when he says that God can do anything and no divine plan that God has conceived can be thwarted or foiled. The scriptures repeatedly remind us of God's omnipotence. I, I think back to Jeremiah's recording for us God's own words in Jeremiah 32, 27, where the Lord says, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? <clears throat> Obviously, that's a rhetorical question that demands a resounding answer of no, nothing is too difficult or impossible for God. It's a message that the angel Gabriel delivered to Mary in Luke 1.37 when she's questioning, how can these things be? Uh, how can she conceive a son when she's a virgin? And, and Gabriel tells her, nothing is impossible for God. It's something that Jesus tells his disciples too when they are shocked and surprised by his statements about how difficult it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. They, that, that doesn't compute with them. They think rich people have been blessed by God. And so in response to their shock, Jesus goes on, uh, and tells them as they ask, well, then who can be saved? He tells them that all things that are difficult for human, things that are impossible for human beings, are not a challenge at all to the Lord because all things are possible for him. Job admits in verse 2 that God can do anything he chooses to do because he is sovereign. He has the, the power, the ability to enact his will and his purposes, even when we don't understand those. Job had suffered tremendously. But this confession of God's sovereignty indicates at last he's come to adopt a, a new perspective on God's authority over all things in his life. In verse 3, Job recites back to God the very words that the Lord had uttered to him previously in Job 38, 2, where the Lord asked who it was who was concealing God's counsel with ignorant words. And now Job confesses that this is exactly what he had been doing. He acknowledges that he was way out of his league and guilty of speaking about things that he didn't understand and could not possibly hope to grasp. He, of course, as we've mentioned, wasn't aware of the heavenly contest going on between the Lord and Satan when he challenged God's allowing him to endure so much heartache and suffering. He describes these things here as being too wondrous for him to know. Now, we typically take the word wondrous, or as other Bible translations express that term, too wonderful, as something quite positive. But I think here the context demands a different understanding of that term. And a couple of the modern translations, I believe, capture the sense of the word better with the use of phrases like things too mysterious for me to know or marvels too great for me to understand. Because Job surely isn't viewing his suffering itself as wonderful, but rather as something that he now acknowledges is way above his pay grade and utterly impossible for him to, to completely understand. The passages that we looked at last week with the lengthy series of questions that God directed to Job to uh, reveal to Job his lack of knowledge of God's creation and, and underscore how limited Job's comprehension of God's ways are. Job had crossed the boundary of expressing his inability to grasp God's ways into the realm of challenging God's authority and sovereignty. And this passage reveals that at last Job has learned an important lesson in that area, and it has prompted him to manifest a greater degree of humility. The irony of believing that Job could instruct God about anything has at last registered in his mind. And when we come to verse 5, we find Job admitting that his knowledge of how God operated in the world had been best at, at best based on secondhand reports. He presumed on the basis of what he had heard from others, like his three friends who kept telling him that God rewards good people and punishes the wicked, that that's how God inevitably operated. 
And the questions that God had directed to him in that encounter with the Lord had opened his eyes to a greater understanding of who God is in his sovereignty. He sounds very much like the psalmist Asaph in Psalm 73, who at length there describes his struggle to understand why God permits the righteous to suffer while the wicked are prospering. But in Asaph's case, at least, in verses uh, 16 and 17 of, of Psalm 73, Asaph tells us that when he came into the sanctuary of God, he gained a fresh perspective that allowed him to understand how God would eventually deal with the wicked. And Job responds in similar fashion in verse 5 when he says that whereas he was operating on the basis of report, reports he had heard about God previously, now he has seen the Lord. And that encounter with God prompts Job in verse 6 to express his remorseful repentance, re rejecting his previous words directed against God and saying now he is sorry for having uttered them. And just as we saw last week when Job was forced to say he was insignificant or nothing, now he expresses that humility with other imagery, saying that he is merely dust and ashes. Those two images surely don't uh, suggest anything of great value or worth, and Job sees himself as minute and inconsequential in comparison with God. We probably need to clarify here again that Job isn't repenting of, um, of some specific sin for which God has been punishing him, but rather for the bitterness that he has harbored toward God in his heart as he accused God of dealing unjustly with him. Well, the Lord next shifts his focus in verses 7 through 9 to Job's three buddies, singling out Eliphaz as the representative leader of the trio. And God tells Eliphaz that he is angry with him and his two friends because, unlike Job, they haven't spoken the truth about God. They had asserted since the time that they first broke their silence after that first week of just being silent in Job's presence that Job must certainly have sinned in some awful fashion to deserve such harsh punishment at God's hands. And they, while they had finally given up hopes of convincing Job of their viewpoint, as we saw in Job 32.1, they never did back down from those false accusations directed against him. And whereas Job had repented of his bitter attitude toward God, these three had failed to repent of their presumption and judgmentalism by concluding without any evidence that Job had committed some heinous sin. They, they further added insult to injury by continuing to charge him falsely, even in the midst of his great suffering. And now the Lord instructs these three to go to Job, whom God calls my servant, and to take with them seven bulls and seven rams for a burnt offering, a sacrifice, and he requests as well that they have Job pray and intercede for them. And rather than just some vague, generic kind of confession, God instructs these three to take specific actions to repent of their wrongdoing. And that's a really good guideline for us as well when the Holy Spirit convicts us of having sin. Rather than uh, including some catch-all prayer like, God, please forgive me of all my sins, we should specifically confess whatever wrongful action, word, or thoughts that we've been guilty of committing or entertaining in our, in our thoughts. And we read in verses 8 and 9 that Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar do indeed obey the Lord, and they go and do exactly as he had instructed them to do. And in response to their obedience and Job's prayer of intercession for them, the passage suggests to us that these three were restored to fellowship with Job as well as with God, for we read that the Lord accepted Job's prayer. And it's certainly worth meditating on as well, the grace and the kindness that Job showed to these three friends who had badgered him so mercilessly with the accusations that he had sinned. We're, I think, reminded of Jesus who interceded on the cross for the very soldiers who were so cruelly executing him. Job's example of intercession also points us to Jesus who is the perfect intercessor. And according to Hebrews 7.25, we read, he ever lives to make intercession for us. Following Job's intercessory prayer for his three friends that leads to their restoration, God himself intervenes in Job's life and restores his fortunes, actually doubling the amount of his previous possessions, according to verse 10. And if you skip down to verse 13, which is beyond our focal lesson, we read as well that God restored to Job the precise number of children who had died in that storm when the house collapsed on them. Job has seven more sons and three more daughters. Now, I don't think we're meant to jump to the conclusion from that statement that these new children could somehow replace those who had died. Any parent who has suffered the horrific misfortune of losing a child to death would undoubtedly argue that no subsequent child born into the family or one even added through adoption could ever take the place of one who had died. 
And the other warning I think that needs to be sounded at this point as well is not to assume that what happens with Job when God doubles his previous possessions is a hard and fast rule for how God will inevitably treat everyone who turns to him in repentance. We simply can't program God like some celestial vending machine to automatically dispense a specific blessing when someone prays and repents. That mindset borders on the same kind of mistaken concept that the three friends of Job had about being able to infallibly determine uh, why Job was allowed to suffer by God. We cannot place God in a box, nor can we dictate to him that which he must do. But the restoration that takes place of Job's wealth perhaps isn't as important to him as the restoration we read about in verse 11 that included his being reconciled to his brothers, his sisters, and his former acquaintances. We read earlier, back in Job chapter 19, verses 13 through 19, that all of these had essentially abandoned him and turned their back on him during his suffering. Here's, here's how the New Living Translation expresses Job's lament uh, over having lost those relationships. He writes, My relatives stay far away and my friends have turned against me. My family is gone and my close friends have forgotten me. My servants and maids consider me a stranger. I'm like a foreigner to them. When I call my servant, he doesn't come. I have to plead with him. My breath is repulsive to my wife. I am rejected by my own family. Even young children despise me. When I stand to speak, they turn their backs on me. My close friends detest me. Those I loved have turned against me. Job is, has been abandoned by all of those who are near and dear to him. And in the beautiful scene of restoration that is pictured in verse 11, Job's brothers, his sisters, and his former acquaintances come to visit him and they share a meal with him in his home at his table. They console and they comfort him for all the adversity he has endured at God's hands. And whereas their earlier visits had multiplied his suffering and adversity with their accusations, now they multiply his wealth as each of them brings a piece of silver and a gold ring or an earring as a gift. We must remember, of course, that God, what God does for Job isn't a guarantee that all those who turn in faith to him will be similarly blessed. Job had suffered tremendously and now God graciously restores his wealth and his family to him. But not all will receive those kinds of blessings in this life. But at the same time, we have the amazing promise of God's word that all who suffer as Christians in this life can expect God's abundant blessings in the life to come with him in heaven. One of my very favorite verses in the amazing eighth chapter of Romans 8 is verse 18, where Paul writes these words. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And if anyone ever knew what it meant to suffer as a follower of Christ, it was Paul. Writing of some false teachers who had hoped to discredit Paul's apostleship, he says this in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 28. Speaking of those false apostles, are they servants of Christ? I'm speaking as if insane. I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death, Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent adrift at sea. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the cities, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Paul certainly had suffered tremendously as a missionary and as a follower of Christ. And he who was intimately acquainted with suffering said that all he had endured was a drop in the bucket and not worthy to be compared with what God has in store for us in the future with him in heaven. That promise of a bright and glorious future where sin and death are no more, where God's perfect will is unchallenged and always done, awaits all of those who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. Well, I want to thank you for being a, a faithful participant with me in these, this, these studies of the book of Job in recent weeks. Uh, next week, we will launch into a, a study of the book of Ecclesiastes that will wrap up the current quarter uh, in our Lifeway Explore the Bible curriculum. Thank you for joining me this evening. Let's conclude our time together in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the humility, for the grace that Job demonstrates in 
being able to intercede for these friends of his who had so so cruelly uh, charged him with wrongdoing and with sin. And Lord, we're amazed at the grace that he demonstrates. And we know that's a, a demonstration of your grace at work in his life. Lord, help all of us to, when we do not understand your ways, and we again recognize that Job never really did come to grasp fully why he was permitted to suffer, and yet he committed his ways to you. Help us to do likewise, Lord, when we when you, we can't understand your ways or trace your hand. Let us, as we talked about in that song from last week, let us trust your heart. Bless my friends, bless these brothers and sisters in Christ this evening is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you this coming Sunday. A reminder, we're on a new schedule this coming Sunday because of our VBS wrap-up. We will have all of our community groups meeting at 930, a joint one service at 1030, and then uh, a cookout, a picnic across the street uh, as a block party at 1130 in the vacant lot across the street by the missionary residence. So hope to see you then. God bless you and have a great remainder of your week.